I think that uh, uh, modeling efforts should be part of the first response and because we have learned now uh, that we, 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 are, we can actually model a plume coming out from the deep waters. Uh, we can make this model more operational and with quick information of the chemical component of the oil from a spill, we could assess uh, in a better way how to focus the uh, rescue efforts on the surface and also at depths. Um, I think technical development uh, uh, of ROVs with sensors and uh, numerical models can be very powerful to uh, minimize the primary effect of the, or the near field effect of this oil spill. When we're thinking about the right kind of monitoring to do in the Gulf, there, there are two issues. One is the kinds, the scale of natural variation in the system. So there's going to be year-to-year -year variation in any population we might study, and there will be longer-term variation due to uh, climate cycles, El Nino cycles, other um, global climate cycles, due to sea level rise and climate change and so on. And so we really are talking about decadal long programs. In addition, the other thing you have to think about is how long the impacts that you're interested in studying might be. And the big questions that we're interested in are also long-term issues. So in the case of oil spills, oil persists in the environment for decades following oil spills. So if we want to study that, we need to have monitoring programs that last for decades. The biggest obstacle to understanding the impacts of this oil spill has to do with the fact that the impacts are likely to be modest rather than severe in any one place. So because the oil was diluted so much, we're not necessarily going to have massive fish kills or massive mortality in habitats. Instead, what you were much more likely to see is incremental reductions in populations. All cleanup activities are not necessarily beneficial. They're all mixtures of things that are good and bad. So we had a lot of public debate about the use of dispersants. Was that a good idea or not? Because uh, it had some good effects in terms of diluting the oil, and it also perhaps had bad effects because the dispersants were toxic. The same thing applies to anything else we might do. If we're uh, cleaning up beaches, which seems like an obvious thing to do, well, that involves heavy equipment and people on the beach, which compacts the sand and it, the operations disturb the sand, and so that can be harmful to beach-dwelling organisms. If we increase river flows to try to push the salty water with the oil offshore, the, all that fresh water can kill organisms that are used to living in seawater. Uh, if we put out booms to trap or soak up oil, those booms often end up causing physical disturbance to marshes or oyster reefs. And so, it's not to say that the net effect of these things isn't more good than bad, but we need to weigh both the pros and the cons and not just do things in order to do something uh, because sometimes the activities might do more harm than good. I think the, uh, the major lesson of the response, the oil response as practiced by the Coast Guard and, uh, and, and other agencies, federal and state, was that this was an incredibly large logistical enterprise that involved something like uh, 6,500 vessels and 44,000 human beings who were actively engaged in dealing with this bill. This is unprecedented. It never has in any environmental crisis ever had so much attention. And you have to be pretty impressed with that. It, it is not easy to organize, especially in a quick way. And uh, yes, there were fits and starts and problems, but by and large, there were a lot of resources put out on that problem and people really tried pretty hard to deal with it.